Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and really excited about speaking with our guest today. We are going to talk about an age-old story about eating the forbidden fruit. I mean, we've heard about the story all throughout time, I guess most famously with Adam and Eve eating that forbidden fruit. Uh, I think this is going to be a little different. Uh, we're going to dive into this. For, this is his first book. We're going to go and talk about uh, Officer's personal journey into his rise and demise as a St. Louis City police officer. So he's going to talk about the role of good old family memories, and he's going to talk about the nightmarish reality of being a police officer indicted on federal drug charges. Is that part of eating the fruit? I think we'll find out more with my guest, Roland Page. Welcome to the podcast, Roland. Thank you, Hamza. Yeah, man, glad glad to have you on. And uh, since this is uh, different times that we're living in right now, uh, it says that you are a St. Louis police officer. Do you still live in St. Louis? Yeah, I still reside here in St. Louis, oh. yeah. Okay. And what is happening currently with uh, stay at home? Are people out? Are they listening to the the rules? Or I mean, every state is different. What's, what's the current landscape in St. Louis? Here in Missouri, it's, it's still uh, stay at home. Well, the governor just um, put out that, you know, they could open, but that was override by the, uh, the local government, which is the mayor and so St. Louis County, St. Louis City, you know, we uh, contribute to 40% of the infected and the deaths. So, you know, man, it's, it's, it's real crazy here. And what's so crazy is that, you know, I have lupus. So, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm like ultimate paranoid right now, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I totally hear that. I, I have a sister that has lupus. And, um, you know, that, that coexisting conditions would actually increase your risk. And what's happening in St. Louis City is a, a lot. I'm here in Georgia, and it's pretty much the same scenario where the governor has allowed everyone to go out in, in spaces. But in the city of Atlanta, the, the mayor and surrounding cities are kind of against it based off of, like you said, the numbers. There's a higher concentration of those infected in the cities. So always interested to see, you know, what's happening around the country. Very true, man. Very true. This it just came out of nowhere. And, you know, was, uh, I own a tattoo shop. So, you know, as far as having a strict protocol on infection control, sanitation, sterilization, I was already on board with that, especially being a germaphobe from lupus. So. <laughs> I have to ask you, being an owner of a tattoo shop, uh, there was, you know, with the Internet, uh, stories can go out of control. And one of the the recommended co uh, industries that were opened last Friday and more specifically this past Monday was tattoo shops. And so people are wondering, okay, is it really necessary for me to get a tattoo and why are they opening? That's correct. Because, you know, with the social distance. And, but one thing, we, we always worked, our operation was always by appointment. So, you know, even with the COVID, you know, it's other things, uh, airborne diseases like hepatitis that, you know, we work hand-in-hand -hand with the health department and the CDC it, even before this. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's other things that you got to be alert about. Just It's just not the, the, the corona, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. Uh, you're, you've written a book, Eating the Forbidden Fruit, and it's a tale of, uh, I guess, a rise and fall of a police officer. And the fine lines that happen uh, when you become a police officer as it relates to maybe your immediate community, can you tell us a little bit about your background before coming, becoming a cop? Oh, uh, yeah. I grew up in a military family. Mother, okay. My mother's from Japan. She met my father in Osaka. He's a 38-year veteran of, of the military. He fought uh, three wars, WW2, Korean, and uh, Vietnam. Upon his retirement, we relocated here to St. Louis. That's where he retired. But as, as a uh, kid, you know, I have six siblings. We really, we grew up all over the U.S., man. I mean, so we 
probably I've literally been to every military uh, uh, depot in the U.S. Um, I am prior military myself, uh, a retired member of the U.S. Army. I only did uh, two years tickets back then. I, I went in, enlisted in 83. You could do two years and then with the option of doing six years reserves, and that's what I did so uh, I could pursue a college education. From there, I went to law enforcement because law enforcement, you know, they, they really like people with military uh, background. You know, it's quasi-military anyway. And mm-hmm. from there, that's where, you know, my career started. The thing with um, military and law enforcement is that, you know, you're under a different law than civilian mm-hmm. law. So you're under uh, ethical and moral law. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's a violation to have bad credit in the military, man. And, it, and that goes on with the police department. You know, the creditors can call your commander. And, and you know, you it could be some type of repercussion from that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so you would you say know, a different clause, right? Excuse me. You would say a different clause. I mean, you were held to a higher standard. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's where even with the situation with my book, uh, you know, you're held under a different standard. Some of the affiliation that you had before, this could be childhood friends. With the with in law enforcement, if you have any knowledge of any criminal activity, rather it could be your mother, father, brother, it's up to you to report that or act on it. And that was my dilemma. That's the point of the loyalty. And I'm sure we all saw movies and things like that, but, uh, you know, uh, you, you ask yourself, could I do that as a police officer? Oh, I'm sure. And when you were talking about enlisting in 83 and then the six years reserve, uh, you're talking about the the, the crazy 80s. So it sounds like yeah. you were a yeah, part of, of that. And 83, man. But, oh, you know, yeah. the, the military was a little more uh, calm then. It wasn't as much as uh, uh, so political now, mm-hmm. you know, divided. It was just as one. You know, you grew up, I, I worked with people, different religions, creed, color, and, and we were, it was a brotherhood, man. Even if Absolutely. they came in with a different perspective, you know, at the end of the training or your tour, you know, you bonded with these individuals. You know, you could mm-hmm. agree to disagree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, and it's a lifelong relationship. My my father was in Vietnam, so he tells me, you know, to this day there's there's people that was in his unit that he's still in touch with. Yeah, yeah. You know, my father, being a loyal uh, veteran, serviceman, he didn't want me to go. That's strange. Mm-hmm. Usually, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a parent wants you to follow in the footsteps. He wanted me to pursue more of a, a, a for education. You know, he said, like, hey, the military, you might have to po- postpone your educational pursuits as, as opposed to going to college. He said, if anything, why don't you go to college, get some uh, uh, college credit under your belt and then going. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to, you know, I said, hey, look, I don't think I'm going to get an a academic scholarship, and, and definitely grants were hard to come by, especially if you come from a family that's, you know, in the middle class. So mm-hmm. I did what I had to do, man. You know, it's just, it is what it is. I don't, I have no regrets. Sure. It, it's really funny that you say that, and, and, uh, you know, you don't know me from a can of paint, but it's always interesting how uh, we have these human connections and have similar stories. And so I had a, a, a strange relationship with my father until I was an adult, but he was really happy that I didn't go, even though I was pretty much in the same situation you were in uh, graduating high school. And that was um, 
I'm a little bit younger than you, but that was around Persian Gulf 1, and he was just really elated that I didn't go and, and did wind up going to school. But, yeah, you would think that your parents want you to follow in their footsteps, and my dad really echoed what your father was saying. Yeah, definitely. I believe everything happened for a reason. You know, mm-hmm. if it was meant for me to remain and, and pursue a career, I would have done that. But, you know, uh, things worked out. Even with the situation with me writing my book, which motivated me was uh, two years ago I lost my mom, and she always told me to finish what you started. That was from college to everything, you know, and – uh uh, college wasn't for me, but I did finish to get my associate's degree, which helped mm-hmm. me get in the police department. And uh, she passed of natural causes, but maybe a few days before she said, well, hey, you know, do me a, make me a promise. Finish your book. You, you've been saying that you were going to complete it. Complete it. Mm-hmm. And like that next day, she, she, you know, she went on. Mm-hmm. So I kept my promise, and uh, I finished the book. What you're writing for me is quite a therapy because, like I said, I have lupus, which uh, one of the symptom, symptoms is depression. So mm-hmm. writing helps is a method for me to kind of distract you from my woes. It, it gotcha. really does help. Gotcha. And please accept my condolences for your mom. So uh, definitely Thank shout you. out to your Thank mom you. for that. That means a lot, man. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And and so uh, the 80s, were, I mean, when we look back, it just seems it's a decade like any other, but there was so much introduction from a uh, narcotic standpoint. Um, what was it like when you first enlisted into the police department and and then you know if you can kind of go into was it was it the same when you first started versus when uh, everything happened when I guess this hit the fan I'm sure it wasn't so kind of walk us through it no exactly well my book is full it's it's, it's complete transparency so let me be honest my statute of limitation is up so prior to you know as a youth I did some unethical things I dealt with drugs. Uh, I wasn't never much of a drug user, but uh, I promoted drugs, uh, sold drugs, you know, in layman's terms. Um, when I got in college, taking one of the you know, taking courses back then in college, they they could recruit out of educational institutions. It's forbidden now, but but back then you could walk through the halls and you'll see a military recruiter. And uh, you know, it was it was different then. I just put my app in right then and there. Um, I took uh, because you know it wasn't much email back then, man. But but I took a resume. I followed up with a resume, and hey, they gave me a call. They hired me. And uh, um, getting on the police department. Let's get to your question. Is that St. Louis is a pretty big city, but it's not. It's, it's, it's really a small community, but a high crime. So mm-hmm. I wasn't effective when it came to narcotics because everybody knew me. I was doing tattoos back then, so I was kind of known in the, in the city. I grew up in, in, the, in the North St. Louis which is considered one of the most highest crimes. You know, St. Louis is, I believe, number – no, we actually were number one last year. So, uh, you know, kind of give you an idea of uh, the population per capita. It's, it's, it's not that big. Like, we're not like Chicago, but we have just as many homicide, drug activity, and things like that. And <clears throat> that's – what really put the target on my back because of the affiliation that I had with some childhood friends who, uh, you know, they they indulged in a drug activity. Now, Mm -hmm. did they implicate me? No. Did they ever, per se, like, give me drugs? No, but we were, it was a brotherhood. 
say, for instance, if I needed some money. These are guys that I know when I first moved to St. Louis. You know, I mean, I, I'm talking about from grade school. If I needed something, yeah. Would they ever ask me to use uh, my authority to elude any activity or anything like that? Did they ask for information, whether they were under surveillance? No, it was never nothing like that. But still, when I took that oath as a commission officer, as a peace officer, you know, that was still inappropriate what I did. I was guilty, no doubt. Mm-hmm. You know, because I knew what they were doing. I, I'll, be, I'll be an idiot. That's why I couldn't sit there and lie. I had a great lawyer. I had the best lawyer in the Midwest. And uh, uh, could I beat it? Yeah, maybe could have argued, but I didn't. I felt so guilty at heart that I, I, I just took it on the chin. I felt mm-hmm. that that was the, the right thing to end the indictment, not to uh, tuck my tail and snitch on people to, to make my situation. I know what I did. I know what money I took, uh, things like that. Rather, they invested in me to uh, uh, start businesses. I had my tattoo shop even as a police officer, as a detective. Sometimes I used to get off, take off my suit, and put on my scrubs and start tattooing. So even uh, as a tattooist, it was a conflict with the department. They didn't want me to do that as a secondary employment because they mm-hmm. felt that I was around uh, suspect uh, customers and you know, if suspicious customers, if you could say. Mm. So that's kind so of just in the gist of how it unfolded uh, and um, they got me through association, and they had wiretaps and, and things like that. Uh, uh, once again, I said that I felt guilty because of my past involvement, the things that I got away with. I felt everything caught up to me. I said, so, like, let, let's cut it off here, handle it like a man, go do what you got to do. You're going to plead guilty go do your time, get out, and, and lead a productive life. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. I put it all behind Let me ask. Sure, sure. And, yeah, of course, to, and to tell that story, I'm sure just kind of, you're touching so many people with this book. Oh, yeah. Uh, I do. You know, I would like people to read the book because it's like being, you know, the, the book starts with me in the courtroom, and I look back coming from a good family. Yeah, I grew up in the mm-hmm. hood, but, but I came from a good role models, and I reflect back, where did I go wrong? You know? Because what, how did I get here to this point? And I start to remember, I go back to the archives, and it helped me remember good things that I forgot. So writing this book was so therapeutic because I forgot things that made me laugh. There's a lot of humor in it. There's uh, drama in it. And it's it's a romance because, you know, today I'm married to my high school sweetheart. Nice. I've been with her since Very 16. Nice. I'm 55 years old. Very nice. Yeah, and yeah we went through a, a lot. We went through a lot. So, like, p- people, you want to read the book because you'll see how the feds tried to turn her against me. They showed her pictures of it could have been just – it was really a business, like, like I was out in the public and somebody walked up to me, a female, and said, like, hey, you did my tattoo. And she might be showing me, uh, like, a, maybe a little discreet uh, uh, area, but, but it wasn't nothing. It was strictly business. And they took pictures of that, and they went back to show my wife, man. <laughs> and they tried to oh, get yeah. her to turn against me. But, you know, when you got a solid woman, uh, the, and this this is a book a lot of women will like uh, uh, relate to it because you know uh, they ask the question why do men cheat? You know, for me it was never a thing that I would try to replace my wife. I I wasn't looking for nothing better. It was just something selfish act, ignorant act. Mm. What what I find really interesting, Roland is in 2020 or 2019, 2018, 
there's been interviews with all of the kingpins from from California to Miami, you know, and they were in that era of the 80s. And as you were painting that picture of you sitting in the courtroom, um, some of them had the mindset of, you know what, I probably have a small window that I can uh, flourish, if you will, but I'm willing to do that. And I didn't really know the RICO laws because the RICO laws are relatively new then, and everyone was, most of the guys were, you know, your age were so young in the system versus the 70s. Like in the 70s, as I understand it, older, you know, the older generation kind of pulled the young kids to the side or kept it from them. And in the 80s, it was just so prevalent that there wasn't that uh, passing of the guard, if you will. And so I, I wanted to kind of get an idea of the mindset of high school. Like you said, you were in the hood, and did you play sports? And maybe some of the kids that were in second grade, third grade with you, they started seeing some of that action to make it attractive to you? Yeah, well, you know, g- growing up, it was more about let's see, the, the the '70s because I am a uh, you know I was in high school in the seven the late '70s, but 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 so I'm a '70s, I am a '60s baby, but I grew up '70s and '80s. They had a great influence on me. Things mm-hmm. are different now. You said like like you just said, and you brought up a great point. 2020, the way things are now, the let's talk about the the drug realm, the drug game, it's full of violence, um, unnecessary violence, real deceitful because, you know, people are passing off bad drugs. See, if back in the 70s and 80s, the guys I knew were businessmen. Some of them were lawyers. You know, I'm not going to put nobody business out there, and I don't. That's why I classify my book as a fiction to protect a lot of people. So I I don't put – I respect a lot of good people privacy. But most of them, they didn't like all that drama. No homicides, unnecessary crime, anything that would have brought you under the microscope. It was all about having fun. You know, you you see, like, uh, a great movie, Club 54, or you saw uh, uh, one of my favorite actors, Johnny Depp, on Blow. You know, so, so it's different areas. And then you can go to Scarface and, and things like that. That that wasn't my type of operation. Even though I am part Hispanic and I knew people and I know people in the cartel, it's all over. But I'm not saying that they're all gang members. They're affiliated, but they're some of them are businessmen. Some of them, you know, own multiple businesses and give free health care to, to the people in their community. They make sure that on every holiday that they eat well, Cinco de Mayo, things like that, give out jobs. So, you know, on my area, you know, it, it is some urban element in it because, of course, of course, I grew up in it, but then again, that wasn't just it. I don't want people to think, like, if you pick up that book, it's another book about, a young man on the street corner, uh, uh, a Puerto Rican cat on the street corner just peddling drugs. It's, it's not like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it just shows you how um, in everyday life how things can tie in together. You'd be surprised that even politicians, even people in the religious institutions, how they may know somebody that is actually indulging in that activity. Mm-hmm. Do you let me? No, it was all about the fun back in the seventies and eighties. You hear about that, like Club Fifty Four, the music, having a good time, and you know. And that's what I wanted to ask you because you know, in the like you said, the late seventies, early eighties, that was before the introduction of automatic rifles. And so, would you say that uh, you know, I, as I understand it there used to be two different sides. Like there were people that sold drugs and there were people that were in gangs, but with the, with the drugs and the combination of military weapons, that's what increased the violence. Would you say the same thing in, in St. Louis? So very true. So very true. A lot of, a lot of, it became a lot of competition. 
So the drug lords start hiring the gangs. You know, like in the city, I've known situations where I read about here this grown man, he's in his 30s, went and got these juveniles to do the dirt for him because he know he he, he knew that they're under a different jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. They're you know they're juveniles and they might get convicted in juvenile court and under the Sunshine Law, once they turn uh, uh, to adult twenty one, that it all disappears. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I do want to ask you about communities too. And so, uh, just recently on social media, there's. I mean, it seems like every couple of months that these videos pop up, but uh, another uh, gentleman of color was uh, shot on video in front of everybody. And so there's always that argument of, quote, unquote, outsiders in the community, and it should be your own people in the community. But what you've highlighted is a lot of the, the conflict. If you grew up in that community, that is it. Did you feel like it's automatic, or there's always going to be that conflict where we can't police our own neighborhoods? It, it's going to always be a problem. For, um, I tell you this, just not just that as a law enforcement. What makes St. Louis is so dangerous? It's really not so many gangs now. You know, you got more of uh, what they call cliques or blocks. Mm-hmm. So the the 4,300 block may not get along with the 4,600 block. That's three blocks away. That's how dangerous it is. Now, all the residents in there, they're petrified to even come forth, to even, you know, report the crime. That's why so many crimes go unnoticed. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's the, the, um, the sad part of what's going on in society now. That's the new day and age of crime. The new crime, one of the new... Sorry about that. Some, somebody alarm just went off. Yeah, okay. The I new, was like, are you on the block right now? Yeah, no. Look, <laughs> the new, you know, the new crime now is why sell drugs when you can rob the drug dealer. Mm-hmm. Let him do all the work. What he's going to do, report it? He's not going to report it. You know, you have a whole different quality of crimes that's so deviant now. You, you know, they don't care that you, you, you have a, a – it was back then, but, you know, with social media, but it wasn't as abundant as it is now. Uh, nine-year-old kids getting killed. I can say this. One thing as a police officer, you know, what's the main, one of the main um, missions is to go go home safe. Mm -hmm. Go home to your kids. Mm -hmm. You know, law enforcement is manned by human. uh, So, therefore, it would always be subjected to error and mistakes. You know, mm-hmm. I don't think no officer has a mind frame like I just want to go kill somebody. You know, they don't. Nobody wants that liability. No one want to put their their life on the line or their freedom. Mm-hmm. But you know, it is you know that uh, fight or flight. You know, when you're under certain situations, like I've been in situations where I chased the individual down four or five blocks knowing he committed a crime. When I finally got him, I kid you not, I wanted to uh, uh, lay hands on him. Mm-hmm. I wanted to rough him up. That's when strict discipline comes in and you got to catch yourself, man, because the mm-hmm. eyes are out there. You know, the eyes, mm-hmm. the social media, everybody got their phone out. They don't see what happened before. So, you know, even with my situation, I, I harbor no ill will to the police department, I still have a great respect for law enforcement. I still have many friends on it. I can't associate with them because I'm a I'm a I'm a felon. Mm-hmm. And then I know I know some 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 bad ones. It's more it's way more good ones than bad ones. 
Uh, absolutely. It would be, be way more chaotic here in, in, in the world if it was more bad police. Can you just imagine that? No, not at all. Not at all. And uh, I'm no, thinking of when you it, said... And it's not about color either. You know, you got some good white police officers, you got some good black police officers, and vice versa. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I agree with you for that. Uh, uh, but the question I would ask, is not more not so much color but culture like where uh, let's just say in that scenario uh i guess the best example i could use is, is the the movie shrek right like when it was out i took my niece to go and she's a little kid and you're sitting in the theater with a bunch of adults that brought kids and they were a part of the movie where something would happen and the kids would laugh right and then there are other parts where the adults will laugh so there was a different understanding of the situation that was happening. And so my question is, uh, is there uh, maybe a cultural <laughs> education that needs to happen? Because if I'm not from that community, right, something that may be happening, I may interpret it different from someone that lives in that community. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, what, I got things like that, sensitivity training and whatnot, but but – it's, it's really in the, on the individual, treating people accordingly. I have met people from different backgrounds, and and I've got educated. That was from the military for, for we, you know, I have I met people who said, like, man, I really, of course I've seen, you know, African Americans, but I never interact with them. And we had a good discussion not just as a police officer. I met him in prison. I've actually, like, when I worked in the kitchen area and I sat down with a, uh, um, uh, someone who was in the Klan, and me saying that, you might think it was a hostile conversation. It was, man, it was one of the most... Uh, informative conversations that I ever had in my life, you know, and, and some things we agreed on, some things we disagreed on, but I, 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 you know, I got it. I didn't agree with them, and I didn't say, like, hey, you know, I don't uh, uh, condone what, what you guys do, but he said, like, you know, I'm not about violence, bro. He said, are you a proud uh, a black man? I said, even though I am biracial, but, you know, regardless, I, I, I identify being black because it's what little I have makes me an African-American. So, but he said, you know, you identify being a proud black man. I said, of course. He said, all I am is a proud white man. He said, would I get upset if my daughter married a black man? Yes. He said, would I blame him? No. He said, that's on my daughter. He said, would I treat them, uh, you know, foul? No. But I prefer so I could keep my culture pure for what I'm saying. He said, so why am I wrong with that if if, if you feel the same way? And, you know, I had to agree. I had to. Even though I don't, I don't, for, for me, I don't, I don't uh, really care about race, even sexual preference. You know, I have relatives who are uh, uh, in the pride movement. But I could relate to what he he was saying. With um, you behind bars and speaking with so many people for walks of life, what was it like being a police officer in there? You know, being a police officer is this what I say. Every election, you, you get to, to feel how people think. The real, it, it becomes transparency. You can really tell how people truly feel during election season, any law enforcement. So whoever, whoever watched this and they're in law enforcement or military, they would agree. They was like, yeah, that's when people start saying things openly, you know. And you just got to do it respectful, man. It's just, you know, I as a police officer, I, I've been called a name, and I've seen other officers 
white officers call names, and it's just a, a thing with standing up for what's right. You know, in my case, in my trial or during my crime, uh, uh, racism had nothing to do with it. You know, it, you know, it, it, actually, the people involved in my case were of different cultures. So, you know, mm-hmm. I never had any. Uh, experiences. I've seen certain things, but, you know, I've always stayed away from it. Mm-hmm. So. Did you, would you also, and not naming names or what have you, but, you know, there's always a story, a framework of microcosm of the macrocosm. And so the same things that happen on the outside are the same things that happen on the inside. Did you, was it still that, did you still feel like that allegiance uh, with the correctional officers there, and and did they treat you? This, did they give you any type of priority, or were there things that you had to turn your head from? Like you said, you didn't want to be involved. Like you still saw the same things that were happening on the outside, on the inside. Oh yeah, yeah. You see things, you know. And, and to be honest, when you're when you're locked up, everybody knows you're you're a jacket. That's your file. They call it jacket. So you know inmates can find out anything. So I was in the Fed, so I was there with politicians and everything. A lot of people knew my background. I, you know, I had no problems. I didn't have to go, you know, uh, PC under protective custody or nothing like that because, I, you know, I was comfortable. I never did anybody wrong, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, same thing in the police department is that, um you know, I've seen things and turned my head. You know, I wasn't going to be a snitch. I saw a lot of things that I didn't agree with. Sometimes I voiced my opinion. I just pulled them to the side like, look, you know, the fact that you're doing that around me can implicate me. So all I'm asking you, if you respect me, don't bring that around me. Don't do it in front of me so I'm not involved. And that's how it is. You 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 gotta draw that line, and they'll respect it. Cause they don't want to be told on man. <laughs> sure. But I sure. I mean, stuff. I've seen a lot of things. You know, you think wearing that. Like I said, people wearing that uniform are human. So mm. the temptations that go on in the civilian world, it happens there. So you know. Uh, like you say, not naming no names or no certain incidents. I'm just saying, like, sometimes burglaries happen and people come home and they might see police officers around and say your your house got broken and you go inventory everything. You might not expect that some of that lost inventory might be in the back of the police truck. Mm. Things like that happen. Things like that happen. Oh, sure. Uh, I want to get your take take on this too, because uh, some of what you're talking about is uh, our value system in that people in the service or in the industry of service don't, they're not at the top of the economic chain, you know, so they're, they're kind of hand, not so much hand to mouth, but a little bit above it. So that would go from the teachers to the firemen to police officers. And like you said, as a human, uh, you know, maybe if you're single, you can deal with it. But if you have a wife and kids, it may be some of those pangs. And uh, like you said, that forbidden fruit becomes more attractive. You, you, well, you know how, like the forbidden fruit, you know how I got that, that title? Um, uh-uh. when, when a police officer indulges in unethical activity, any law enforcement, just not a police officer, correction, public safety, is called fruit of the poisonous tree. Mm. Now, the, now, I use the term sin behind the badge sometimes when I, as a blurb or, or what I, whatnot with my book. Eating the forbidden fruit, you know, the apple is the forbidden fruit. It's indulging in sin and that with the combination of that that that's how I came with the title, and you know, they when they say that women are attracted to men in uniforms, it's, it's true. So, 
for a married man, and you start to get the, you you get this God complex that I can get away with anything. Mm. I can look up somebody's background. I can write a parking ticket, and they won't know who wrote it because I don't like them. You know that 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 deviant human nature start kicking in. And those are some of the things that uh, I'm not saying I did that, but I'm, uh, but I, I did some things that was unbecoming of a law enforcement officer. That just not just a law enforcement officer being a married man, and, you know, going through the project areas, and meeting women, and man, I, I, I did some real crazy things man, in my career. You get, you know. Yeah, sure it, I it's, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I sent you a book so you can read about some of them. Some of them's comical, man. Sure. Well, I'm just I'm bringing it to was at the end of April 2020, and we're still in the middle of COVID, and so there are some reports of you know people getting their stimulus or you know people in, like you said in those impoverished areas getting their stimulus check, and that goes right back to the street via, you know, narcotics or, you know, that whole underworld that continues to happen. It's, it's, there's a lot of temptation out there, I'm sure. And if you're, uh, it, it could be tem- temptation every corner that you go on. And, you know, how do you keep, you're like, well, maybe I'll just do, I know you don't jump straight in. I'm sure you would say, oh, I'm going to get my feet wet. This is a small thing. And then it continues to grow. Is that usually the progression? Oh, always. You know, that's just, even with this, with the stimulus, but that's just um, a part of the entrepreneurial spirit. Take a little something and try to make it into something big. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be anything illegal, but it can be something legal, but also illegal because that comes with this, the, the drug game. You can put by a little something and you're going to recoup a lot. And the mm-hmm. things with the stimulus is that People are under pressure. They need a distraction from this depression, this crisis. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure a lot of stimulus went on a lot of uh, things that it shouldn't have. You know, it could have went on feeding the kids, and that's what you got. Women, when I got out, I had to go to an intervention. It was 30 women in this room, and... I heard all this. All, all, I I heard every last one story. How she sex for drugs, the uh, uh, new the baby clothes, pulled out the the ice box, mm-hmm. and it can't. They made me go last. I had to stand up. I had to be transparent because this is part of my release. I had to say I'm not in here for doing drugs. I'm here for promoting drugs. So with that, hearing all that and just not being naive, I can imagine what's going on, you know. And you, mm-hmm. you, you, you see it because they're in a the home now. Now it's, it's a state with the quarantine, you know, they're telling them a lot about my, my wife is in law enforcement. They release, uh, they have four floors of detentions. They release what 50% of the population, of the inmate population, mm-hmm. where they're detained. Mm-hmm. You remember, they, they're inmates when they go to prison. When they're in jail, she works for uh, the police department, so they're detainees. They let them go because of this, of this pandemic. Police are afraid to, to, to pull suspects over because, you know, hey, you never know, man. You hmm. never know. Mm-hmm. So can you imagine what's that? Even if they open up the states that, in your mind, if you knew that, would you pull somebody over knowing it's a slight chance that it, it could, you know, jeopardize your life or your health? Not your life, but your, your, your health. Mm-hmm. And you have kids at home. Mm-hmm. Man, it's just a hard call. You know, unless it's a fleeing felon, you know, I 
me myself, I'll probably be skeptical that I want to pull this individual over, especially if I see four individuals. So this crisis is really going to affect society, and I don't see in some good ways, yeah, maybe to teach people how to budget, save, and, and whatnot, uh, uh, kind of prepare for the future. But I see more cons than pros. Mm. Mm. And there's going to be a lot of drug abuse. Sure. In St. Louis, you well, think that's a quarantine, but, you know, we got more homicides than last year. So it's Really? Like, it's like... It's it's like uh, a lot of tensions are going on. Mm-hmm. Even you break it down statistics, they thought that it would be uh, what they say. This is the this will be for a lot of baby making and, and love and to work on the relationships. But it's the opposite. A lot of them are breaking up, and, and man, it's crazy. It's crazy. Wow. Wow. It it kind of brings me to my next question because. One thing that was interesting, again, listening to some of these kingpins, you know, these were the big guys in the 80s, 90s, what have you. They've been locked up for 30, 40 years. And, you know, on one part of the story, they're like, yeah, I had this and I had that. Uh, But when they come back to their neighborhood, they don't recognize it anymore because there's a Starbucks there and, you know, other cultures are moving in. Uh, Do you think it, what do you think as far as uh, is that a natural progression? People are just going to wait until the, 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 the real estate is running to the ground and then others can kind of come in and get it for pennies on the dollar and then replace those people? Or I mean, a lot of people oh, yeah. aren't thinking about gentrification on that, well, on that thing. Yeah, well, you know, that has always been, you know, uh, uh, some people used to call it conspiracy, but that's just a part of development. You know, it's just a part of development. That's what happens, you know. When you mm. when you get a uh, area and you say, hey, I'm going to bring it up, I'm not going to bring one or two homes up. My objective is to bring a community, a, 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 a geo region up, and I know that I'm going to get grant money to do this from mm-hmm. a state, federal level, and it's always better to do a project grant than an individual grant. And, and, you know, even me as an entrepreneur, I've, I've done that, you know. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to, to saying that I want to neglect my community, but from a business perspective, uh, I got to do what's right when it comes to business. I, I, own, I own property in the downtown area, St. Mm-hmm. Louis. I sold it to a developer out of Kansas City. I made a pretty good investment off of it, a return off of it. Mm-hmm. He, in return, sold it, well, tried to sell it to the soccer stadium. You know, they just approved for uh, St. Louis to be uh, get a soccer team. And so when the offer didn't come, the number wasn't right, he pulled out. Mm-hmm. So they, the news, the media came and asked me, well, did you expect that? Well, you know, what do you think about this man you sold your property to? I said, like, look, you you, you asking me, he's doing what he feels is right for his family. He's a businessman, you know? So so business can be true. The, mm. the thing of it. Now, when you come to even incarceration, people think like this. People who go to prison, the, the whole uh, ideology changed. Mm. You used to hear guys in prison say, like, man, when I get out of here, I'm going to focus on my family. I'm going to do what's right. Now, sometimes you hear them, like, I think I know the game even better now. Mm-hmm. I can't wait until I get out. Mm-hmm. I got more connections now, and I'm really going to know what to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. You know, I, I'm not trying to be negative and say that the future is so uh, 
grim, but um, that's just reality. You can just watch the media. You watch the news, and it's more bad than good, you know? Everything is well, a debate or a disruption. We can't come together as a party or, or just as Americans, you know? Well, one thing that I do see from, a, I guess, a contrarian point, I guess from an intrinsic motivation <laughs> from a homies perspective, right, is, uh, you know, we're the first generation <clears throat> that are people your age, right, and so that have gone through this. And so, like, you were saying that um, you were surprised that your dad didn't want you to go to the military. There are probably some kids, w- when you were a police officer, like, wow, you know, I don't have to be a drug dealer, per se. You know, there are some people that are in the prison system that are saying, well, uh, that's all I had. I could either, like Biggie used to say, either you sling crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot, right? Like, you only had two options. And now they're like, wow, he so he. He got out of jail, and he sold real commercial real estate. You mean I don't have to go to jail? You know, I could shortcut the process. And I think a a good example of that is uh, Freeway Ricky Ross, because he's you know he does interviews yep. all over now, and he's like, yeah, you know what? You don't have to sell drugs anymore. Like I learned how to do this legitimately and, and, and make even more money without people breathing down my neck or having to pay people off. So you're you're probably in a bigger bigger you could probably you're probably seen in a bigger role that of uh option that the people coming behind you didn't think would exist if you didn't go through what you went through i i tell people that the young generation all the time it doesn't have to be the young, whoever has encountered something similar i tell them like i won't preach to you i will show you the blueprint i will show mm-hmm. you what i did and I just think it's a part of being lazy. You know, uh, look, the government doesn't want just a bunch of bad people. Anybody, society wants you to be able to uh, rehab and, you know, introduce yourself as a better person. There's mm-hmm. programs out there for that. You just got to do your investigation, you know. You got to do your research, and sometimes you might have to start all over and work hard, but, you know, it's just a part of being lazy. Now, if you're one of those individuals, you just think, like, hey, I want to make a doctor's salary, but I don't want to put in eight to ten years, then, you know, you, you take the shortcut, and usually the shortcut leads to, uh, um, to a bad result. Mm-hmm. But it's always options out there. There's grants out there for for felons. Mm. If you see now, like in, in here in St. Louis, that uh, if you haven't been, if you're off any like probation or parole, and you haven't had any convictions or arrests in ten years, you don't have to put that you're a felon on the application now. Mm. That's in that's mandated in a lot of cities now because you'd be surprised mm-hmm. how many, how much population has a criminal record you know like like duis or or anything it could be um i was talking to one of my friends he's an fbi agent and we can't he was in the police academy with me and he went over to the uh federal agencies but he told me that uh, you know, I saw him in the mall. Went just Tom said, "What you doing now?" He said, "Man, look, I handle more indictments on physicians now." I said, "What?" Hmm. He told me, "Like, you know, we have to go in there and we count the controlled substances, and if it's not right, you know, they can't account for those, bro. You know, hey, that's an indictment." He mm-hmm. said, "I got more of those than than the guys on the street, mm-hmm. nurses." And, you know, they trace, they do the investigation, come back to the nurses, to maybe even the, the receptionists. Mm-hmm. So, man, it, it's, it, it's crazy. You know, you'd be surprised how many medical staff are, are actually drug abusers. And my, my physician told me that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's the game because... Uh, you know, you 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 were in the position 
of, look, this is what I've seen for people coming around uh, uh, behind you, right? Like, this is what I've seen. This is the, what you, this is a picture that you think only exists. Let me show you how much more exists out there. It's not just you uh, going through that. There's a, a guy, I want to give a shout out to my, one of my friends, Isaac, because uh, he's retired now, but he was in the prison ministry. And he was just saying that there was just a, a routine, like there was not so much a routine, but a, a template. Like you knew the guys that were going to go to jail from like high school. And when he would talk to them through the prison ministry, they all had like the same story. And it was just like, I didn't know I had these other options or I didn't know these things existed. I always looked at myself as a criminal. And you're talking about other enterprises that may not look like people in the hood and that will give them, oh, wow, I have other options out there as opposed to I can play sports or rap, you know? Um, yeah, definitely. You know, that, that, that's so true. One thing you got to, uh, with society in a whole, needs to uh, uh, understand, too, we're in a millennium of, of, you always heard back then, the crack babies. Now the crack mm-hmm. babies are adults now. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, you got to point that blame out on them, but then you got to understand where they came from, the mind state, where, where they might got that. It might be like a, a embedded um, disease that happened to them when they were youth. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's hard. You know, as a law enforcement, I've always believed in treating treating people accordingly, and I didn't believe that I I, I took it that it was my duty to serve the people. Whether I met a guy on there, I didn't know if he was a felon or whatever. And sometimes I used to go on the scene, and here it is a, a man and a woman, and the guy just totally get a, offended. You know, he get on the on the, on the offense and said, like, you know, I know you want to lock me up, and I was like, ho ho. I said, wait a minute. Hmm. Look, I'm here just as much for you as her. All I'm here is to try to find out what's going on and how to come to a solution for both of you guys because I don't want to see nobody get in trouble. And here this guy, I'm a small guy. I'm only like 5'7". I weigh 155. I'm in good shape. You know, I've always been in good shape. But here this guy is 6'3", 200 and some pounds, man. And, and, and I'm, you know, I use my mental uh, uh, ability or talents to say, hey, look, and I might see them a month later, and and this ha- has happened a lot. And he said, "Hey, you know what? I appreciate the way you talk to me." Mm-hmm. He said, "You you you treated me like a person." I said, "You are a person, man. You're a human, and I'm not judging you." And to, to think that I used to be a cop under what I went through the media, you know, in St. Louis, it was blasted everywhere because, of course. You know, I made headline news, but for me, years later, to open up a tattoo shop, I have had guys come in my tattoo shop and say, like, you don't remember me. I'm like, nope. And usually I'm good with faces. You locked me up back in 91. I'm like, oh, I'm thinking, oh, where did this go go? He said, nope, mm-hmm. you, you, you treated me real good. You, you know, I asked you to. To, not to tow my car, could you just take the keys and let my mom pick it up? And you did that. And I said, okay. Hmm. I don't remember that. He said, but, yeah, he said, that's why I came here and patronized you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I believe when you, you, you do good, you know, you can. we all hit our bumps and bruises. We all fall from grace, sometimes more than once. But it's how you rebound what defines you as a, a human. Absolutely. So, you Absolutely. know, that's what my book is all about. You know, it's, it's no dramatics, full transparency. It's like putting on that uniform, sitting in a squad car with me, and you think the little things that you 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 don't see on Chicago PD or uh, CSI. 
You know, mm-hmm. these are the everyday things that 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 happens to to law enforcement. What we go through. Do they still encourage? I know it was a popular movie, but. I know in some areas it's encouraged to do ride-alongs just so you can spend a day with the police officer and understand what a, a day in the life is like. Do they still offer that as a program out there? Oh yeah, especially yeah. Um, they uh, you got to go through. I think it's like a two-day course, and then you can do ride-alongs, especially for people who want to get into law enforcement. You know, especially mm-hmm. you see a lot of criminal justice students and things like that. Mm-hmm. The explorers, the explorers is that that that's that uh high school the youth organizations for people who will inspire to be in law enforcement. You don't see too many of them now, but but it's still a few. Sure. Uh, yeah, the other thing now, I, they don't want to be associated. They don't want. I don't want to be seen in a police car. Yeah. The other side of that, not wanting to be seen in a police car, made me think of 50 Cent. And several years ago, he had all his tattoos removed. He was saying that was used to mark me, like that was the easy way for me to get arrested or get identified because of all of my ink. So what would you say to that as a p- former police officer that owns a tattoo shop? Oh, always, always. You know, that's what they do. Even before I opened my tattoo shop, you know, um, you have, when you even, you have a right to uh, pull somebody over and you can just talk casually to them. You know, if they don't want to be detained, you let them go if you don't have a, a just cause. But you can still pull up on anybody and talk to them and observe if they got tattoos. You know, you keep that mentally in your mind. Or you can even note it on what they call they have like a furs. Uh, uh, it's not a official document that you got to record, but it's it's like you can identify somebody with their um, by their tattoos. So you can mm-hmm. meet somebody. Hey, what's your name? You know, he's like, you know, my name's Fred. And, you know, why you want to know? And he keep it at that. But you see, Fred has a a, a spider web or a gun on his form, you can note that, put it in a mm-hmm. computer, and they can look that up. It could be like somebody, uh, a robbery victim. Well, the guy had um, a, a spider web on his right arm and a gun on his left arm, and that hit would show up and you know you don't know his identity but you know his first name is Fred and you Mm -hmm. remember where you pulled him over the area and that's the lead Mm -hmm. okay so that's how you do the gang units the gang units are 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 big on that me being a tattoo artist I never wanted to get into that you know I, I you know with the police department I knew that wasn't for me I will say that I did a great job. I was considered a, a highly respected officer. Mm-hmm. Never missed one day, you know, uh, but I never had any investigations until that situation that ha- happened, and that's why right. it really uh, caught a lot of people off guard. They said, you know, this guy, you know, man, I, I know he came from the streets, but, man, the dude was so good on his business. You know, he had the tattoo shop. What, he, what happened? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what the book is for. Let me explain to you what happened. It right. may not be what you think, you know. Right. One thing that I, I noticed was uh, – one thing I noticed with uh, with all of us staying in the house, right, you have a lot of celebrities that have been doing Instagram lives and such. And so there was this uh, DJ Cash Money. Uh, he's an older DJ from, like, the 80s and whatnot. And that was a time that people bought CDs. And so he did his little session, and then he was like, buy my new CD. He was like, I know y'all might laugh about CDs. And then he opened it up, and it, was, it had all this video component in it, and you could get in touch with him via social media and see all the battles that he's done. And it was a good, really 
a good piece of, of marketing material that you could take with you as far as like, wow, I'm not only listening to this guy DJ, but I also see these interviews and stuff that he has. And the reason why I bring it up, because you, a, a you dropped a lot of jewels in the last hour, one of which was the grants for felons. And I was just thinking if you ever thought of uh, people that buy your book as one of the inserts, hey, these are some of the grants, if you are a felon, that you could access you may not be aware of. Oh, definitely. If, if, if once people on my book, you'll see my website, which is www.ArthurRolandPage.com. So that's uh, Arthur, and my name is R-O-L-A-N-D. T-A-G-E dot com. And, uh, you know, hey, I, it, on my website, it's like the dynasty. It shows what I put together, the legacy, who I'm leaving it to, which is my son. And I discussed a lot of things about uh, grants, um, programs, if you want to become a tattoo artist, you know, some of the things to be a first responder, you know, Everybody in my tattoo shop is a first responder. I was a first responder anyway as a as a military and a, a police officer and you know it's a lot of a lot of educational things or a lot of things you can game yourself up on you know mm-hmm. and if they go through all my and it has all my social media links, so I got a lot of visuals and things like that because a lot of people can say that what they did, but I, I believe the proof is in the pudding. So, you know, mm-hmm. they can see. They see pictures of me back in the day with, you know, I'm clicked up with, with, with my Baudouic white cats and then sometimes, you know, whatever. It's like it could be like I'm in a hood with, with, with some of the brothers and, you know, they – See how I grew up. Some of the mm-hmm. things I said to people I've been around, if they go through my social media, they notice that, you know, I did concerts with Bone Thugs and Harmony, uh, uh, Rakim, Machine Gun Kelly, you know. Uh, I got the Ghetto Boys doing a video, and it's so hilarious because Bushwick Bill was telling the masses, like, if you didn't get your tattoo from Black Pearl, you messed up. Of course, it wasn't like that. It was a little more harsher and profanity, but, you know, <laughs> got all those things, man. You know, like you said, DJ Cash Money, I got a, a picture of me and Grandmaster Flash. Mm. You know, things like just a lot of things. You see history from where I got the tattoo game from my grandfather in Osaka, Japan. Of course, he's been deceased, but he was a tattoo artist, and he was tattooed mm-hmm. from his neck to his feet. You know, he was a part of that Yakuza uh, culture, mm-hmm. and um, I got pictures of it. So you know, it's just a lot of things to see, visuals, interviews. And if you investigate further in my social media, if you want to get at me or ask me any questions, you know, I've got no problem with uh, guiding anybody because I believe that to receive blessings, you got to give them. And and Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in that. When I was a selfish man, karma always came and kicked me up the butt. Mm. (laughs) You know, I got got the worst karma, man. You hear me, brother? I got the worst (laughs) karma. Whenever I do wrong, and I'm thinking I'm getting away with, like, the worst thing that happened to me. And I'm like, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Why did I even do it? I thought maybe I could, you, you, can't, you can't hustle the higher entity. You know, I say it like that mm-hmm. because everybody has the inter- interpretation of it. And we're right. all right, you know. Mm. That's a, actually a good way to leave it, you know. Um, Eating the Forbidden Fruit, A Tale of a Convicted Cop is the book, and you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza and Roland. It was a pleasure, man. Let's stay in touch. Man, I I really enjoyed this, man. You know, you really let me uh, touch on some topics. I appreciate it. I hope to talk to you again.
Likewise. Take care, man. You too, bro.